अनि अहिले हामी यहाँ अब बोर्डिङ हुँदैछ थ्याङ्क यू फर जोइनिङ अस इन्जोय युवर बोर्ड राइट भनेर लेखेको छ हजुर नानी पिछाडि पनि आउँदै हुनुहुन्छ मेरो परिवार जम्मै आज हामी यहाँ बोर्डिङ गर्दैछौँ यो हो सिकाको सिकाकोमा आएका छौँ बोर्डिङ हुँदैछ अनि बोर्डिङ गर्दैछौँ त्यहाँनिर पार गर्ने त्यहाँनिर पार गर्ने रहेछ नि
I think that technically makes us a stinky onion. And I couldn't be happier. They say an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but an onion a day works on everybody. Next to drive. Right, there's going to be more of that on the tour. I hope you're prepared. Now, full confession, I'm not originally from Chicago. I am a transplant. I moved down here from the Pacific Northwest just a few years ago. But it did not take me long at all to absolutely fall in love with the city of Chicago. And one of the things that made me fall so madly, deeply in love with Chicago, we are about to experience as we pass under the Sabo Lakeshore Drive up ahead of us and watch the city of Chicago unfold before us. It's a spectacular view. You all are incredibly lucky to be here on such a beautiful day. Uh, and I'm actually going to hop off the mic ever so briefly as we pass Next under the here. Uh, because I want us to all just take in the city as we come in, uh, as we come out from under to so make sure it's dry. So, friends, join me as we watch the stinky onion. building of the three towers that ascend up into the sky. This is the St. Regis. Completed in 2020, it is the third tallest building in Chicago, and it is the tallest building in the world designed by a woman. This was designed by Jeannie Gang of Studio Gang. And there's actually a lot more that I want to tell you about the St. Regis, but I need to provide you with some context first, about 75 minutes worth. So we'll talk about it again on the return trip. But I'm not going to not mention it at the outset. I mean, look at it. It's gorgeous. If you look behind the St. Regis there, you can see that balcony and that gap there, or that, that building, that, that gap there with those crazy green balconies. That is Aqua Tower, completed in 2009, and it's actually the second tallest building in the world designed by a woman. It was also designed by Jeannie She literally updated herself when she designed the St. Regis. Now the fun thing about Aqua Tower and those balconies is that they are designed to sort of melt the lines from the region, very common in the region. And because those balconies are entirely unique from each other, they actually break up the wind vortices at those higher levels, making those balconies very comfortable for the residents of that building. Additionally, they're slightly offset from each other, and so they actually allow neighbors to be able to communicate with each other, both above and below, which I think is very neat if you're into that. If not, I'm pretty sure those doors and windows still match, so there's no problems there. Out here to our right, you can see this beautiful fountain here. This is the Centennial Fountain. It was dedicated in 1989 to the the Metropolitan Water, Water Reclamation District of the Greater Chicago Area. Uh, but that organization, later on, we're going to tell, tell you a story about how disgusting the river was in the mid-1800s. And actions were taken to clean up the river. And it was the sanitary district that was responsible for those actions. It's quite the story, and I can't wait to tell you about it later. Uh, the, the fountain actually uh, suffered some damage in 2000. It's not quite sure what that is. Cool. It does make my job a little bit difficult. Look, sir. Uh, Drum Lehigo, Columbus Drive. Now up ahead, a couple of bridges down is Little Michigan Avenue. And that's uh, where the lake met the river when the first European settlers arrived here. So which, which means that all the land on the side of us right now is all man -made. And one of my favorite stories about the land on the right in particular is in 1886, a man named Captain George Robinson got his boat stuck on a sandbar in Lake Michigan. Now the boat was left there for so long that sand could be left in the tower. The city was also doubled with the green in the lake at that time as well. So no, you guys are good, Tower. One of the reasons an 86-acre neighborhood popped up in Lake Michigan. Captain's dream decided to call that land the new strip of Lake Michigan, and he proclaimed himself the ruler of it. He would sell concessions to any folks who would have the lawns to take a look at the new strip of Lake Michigan. He sold parcels of that land to the uh, friends. And uh, during the 1893 World's Fair, he actually set up a little bit of a taxi service. He got his boat back up and running. And was ferrying people back and forth between the Eastern Lake Michigan yeah, and the Eastern Lake Michigan. He and his friends continued to fight for that land until his passing in 1921. And then his descendants took up the fight and fought until 1928 when the courts finally ruled with the Chicago Land and Trust and handed that land back over to the city. We still call that neighborhood over there to our right, though, Streeterville, to this day. 
in honor of that wild, wild man at the George Wellington Street. Back to the buildings. Up here on our right, we've got this white building with a clock tower up ahead. This is the Ripley Building. And if that name sounds familiar, that's because it's the same Ripley as Ripley Field and Ripley Junior. The Ripley Building was opened in 1924 and is designed in a style called Spanish Revival. We'll actually see a couple of revival styles of architecture over the course of the tour. And that's because there was a period of time in American history when we didn't really have an architectural voice of our own. So we often looked to Europe and to the past for inspiration. In fact, the clock tower there of the Wrigley Building is modeled after the bell tower of the Seville Cathedral in Spain. The Wrigley Building is also clad with 250,000 glazed terracotta tiles. They are decorative with a slight gradient that draws the eye upward. They provide a degree of fireproof and they are incredibly delicate. So the Wrigley Building has to be washed by hand, which I can tell you. The next building I want to tell you about is very easy to identify because it is helpfully wearing an name tag. It's also on the right side of the river. It is, of course, the Trump International Hotel and Tower. This is the second tallest building in Chicago, and it is an excellent example of contextualism. So contextualist architecture is very much site-specific. It wants to draw inspiration from its surroundings, both natural and constructed. In the case of Trump Tower, there are three setbacks going up the side of the building. And those setbacks correspond with the heights of neighboring buildings. This first setback over here on the right is the same height as the Ripley building right next door. The second setback up there on the left is the same height as the Jewelers building, the very ornate dome building up here on the left side of the river. And the third setback up there on the right is the same height as AMA Plaza, the black box building just beyond Trump Tower. We will get a better view of that one as we come around the building. Now, Trump International Hotel and Tower was completed in 2009, and it was designed by a man named... I knew that, 2000. This is a guy who knows a thing or two about tall buildings, as he's the designer of the current world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And if you're curious as to how Trump Tower stacks up against the Burj Khalifa, you would literally need to stack it. Two Trump Towers stack one on top of the other, would give you the approximate height of the first yeah, did, did, did. I also find that hard to believe. Just beyond Trump Tower on the right, this large black box building here, this is AMA Plaza, in 1972. It was designed by a man named Ludwig Venus Van Der Rohe. Now, he originated the phrase, less is more. And I think that philosophy is very well represented, and it's the largest of his black box modernist buildings. Hey, stark and dark, simple and efficient. We will discuss it. Soldier, bye bye. Well as well as in Next, we're going to talk about these corn cob shaped towers out here on the right. These are part of a complex called Marina City, designed by a man named Bertrand Goldberg. He believed that buildings should reflect nature. In his words, there are no brand angles in nature. So we know he's perfect in modern We know the city was completed in 1968. The downtown area was still largely industrial and quite smelly. So there wasn't a lot of demand for residents. Bertrand Goldberg's solution to this was a city with a This apartment complex is included in shops and restaurants. A bowling alley, an ice skating rink, a cinema which has since become the Chicago House of Blues. There's also, of course, a marina to park your boat and a garage to park your car. Now they own the property. There aren't enough suspenders and spas in the world to give you the confidence to park in that garage. You see my story from earlier, but they just work on it. Shifting our attention over here to our left, we're going to highlight a few buildings that I think incorporate time. As an interesting architectural quirk, we get away. The 77 West Rockers Mirror Building with a white stone. This building is designed in a style called neoclassical. So, to break that down, you've got neo, which means new, and classical, which references the architecture of the ancient world. In this case, that would be ancient Greece. That's another the bridge. You'll be able to look up and see that uh, 77 West Rocker looks a lot like the Parthenon of Boston. So the inspiration for this building comes to us from the distant past, where the materials and techniques used were much more common in 1992. 
shifting our attention to right next door. We've got this reflective building cutouts going down the side. Also, uh, this is 111 West Wacker. And those cutouts represent Chicago's canals and also contain balconies or uh, patios, which correspond with the heights of eight brick buildings and another example of textualism. But everything below that first patio there was originally part of a different building, the Waterview Tower. Before construction was halted following the 2009 or 2008 financial crisis, so the building was actually abandoned for quite a while. It was ultimately salvaged. The stone exterior was replaced with reflective glass, and 34 more floors were actually completed in 2014. So this building gets its foundation and some of its bones from the past from the previous building. And if we move two doors down, we can see this blocky building here with the columns along the top. This is the builder's building. And the side of the building closest to us here was completed in 1927, but the extension over there on the right was completed in the 1980s, 60 years later. You can see, though, how the designers of the extension honored the original intention to the building without our recognizing it, almost like a call and response group. So if you've been paying attention, we've got a spark, a start, all plucked from the past and used by designers to inform their presence in what I like to call a quantum collaboration. Right. Some of the buildings here in Chicago get a little bit wibbly wobbly, metaphorically speaking. Of course, they all feel very sound. Now, up ahead on the river is one of our many fixed trending bascule or Chicago style bridges in the Wells Street Bridge. Chicago is home to the most movable bridges in North America, 37 in total. We're number two worldwide by Amsterdam. Both the Wells Street Bridge here and the Lake Street Bridge on the South Bridge are double deck bridges with the top deck. Serving our L trains, as you saw. So called because we pop up our L. So if you're visiting from out of town, if your camera's at the ready, there is no more Chicago photo. As we pass under the Wells Street Bridge, we're going to direct our attention out here to the right so that we can talk about this little guy. What we're looking at here is a two and a half acre facade that belongs to merchandise. Completed in 1930, it was the largest building in the world until the completion of the Pentagon in 1943. It is an excellent example of Art Deco architecture. It's got deep inset windows to enhance that verticality. And it's got geometric ornamentation. You can see the diamond and chevron patterns along the bottom and along the top of the building. Art Deco has come to represent the opulence and optimism of the 1920s. Merchandise Mart picks up two city blocks. Right, yes. It has seven and a half miles of hallways, 4.2 million square feet of office space. It has its own L stock, and up until 2008, it actually had its own. These days, though, it does share with the Now, at this point on the tour, we are making our first approach to Wolf Point. This is the location on the Chicago River where the north, south, and main branches of the river meet. And it is the historic center of the city of Chicago. Chicago was incorporated in 1833 as a wilderness outpost with a population of about 350 people. Over the course of the next 70 years, that population would expand to 1.7 billion at the turn of the century, making Chicago one of the fastest growing cities in history. Wolf Point is the location of many firsts for Chicago, including the first tavern. The appropriate name, Wolf Point Tavern, which was located on the West Bank, right now where that brand spiral sculpture sits today. That sculpture, by the way, is called Constellation. It was designed by Spanish sculptor and architect Santiago Alvarado. Just beyond that sculpture is a contextualist building built in 2017 called River Point. The curve of the building mirrors the curve of the river down below, but this parabolic slice cut out of the bottom of it is to prevent the building support from interrupting the active train tracks that run beneath that plaza. According to one of my younger guests, that cutout also serves me. They'll look at this thing from a hot dog. Oh, I'll we'll actually discuss a couple of methods over the course of the uh, tour of how buildings manage the little space along the river. As we head up the North Branch, we're actually going to see the oldest building that we see on the tour. So we come to my house on our left, which is currently right ahead of us. This brick colored block building on the head here 
is Fulton House, originally constructed in 1898 Fulton Story. Between the Civil War and the 1920s, Chicago was the center of production in New York. Both Carl Sandberg was against the Fulton of Chicago with the line butchers of the world. Barges of meat, which are used in the stockyards of the South, to be frozen in buildings like Pope House before being loaded onto refrigerated train cars and shipped around the country. After decades of antitrust actions to decentralize meat production in the U.S., Pope House was closed. And then in the 1970s, it was converted to the first time by making county meats. The story goes that it took six months for the building to thaw completely. And when they cut through the four foot thick walls that had windows, they found them stuffed with pork and horse hair as insulation. So, my apologies to the vegan folks. Between its original function and its construction, Fulton House is not vegan. The man who oversaw those renovations, again, his name was Harry Weeks. He also designed the River Cottages right next door. College, yeah, college. He was said to be an avid sailor. You can see that in some of the design choices of these rooms of old postmodernists, including the round, almost portable style windows, as well as the prominent use of triangles, said to be inspired by the sails of his boats. Very loose of the triangle. Those of you that may be about that riverfront life might be interested to learn that the third town home from the left. Last sold in 2015 for two and a quarter billion dollars. As we pass under the Kinsey Street Bridge, we're going to direct your attention to the right, just on the other side of it, where we'll see a large, somewhat industrial looking building. It almost looks like a massive warehouse, but in fact, this is a high end fitness center of the East Bank Club. Their past membership includes Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Billy Jean Green. And when the East Bank Club was completed in 1980, the river was still quite gross. So buildings built along the river often two takes away from it. My understanding is many of these windows are actually a later addition. However, after extensive cleaning as part of a beautification effort that then made Richard and Daly for the 90s, the river got a lot nicer and more residential buildings began to pop up, including the Kinsey Park townhomes out here to our left. These elegant brick townhomes were pre-sold by their completion in 2001 for between $1.6 million and $3 million a piece, illustrating the changing attitudes about the other side of the city check out. Now at that price point, you certainly don't want somebody shouting at you living for a quarter past three on a Sunday afternoon. So I'm going to hop off the mic while we turn the boat around. Once we've completed that turn, I'll hop back off while I head down the South Branch. But in the meantime, it's important that we stay happy and healthy. So please visit me in bar and visit our office. You can also find me down if you have any questions. They do close it once a year and drive a vehicle across it, so they consider it still an active place. Across Wall Point, you're taking the right side of the river. We've got this building that is kind of like a turning point for maybe some of the Japanese pencil on the river frontier. This is 150 North Riverside. And the reason for its interesting shape is that that sort of Y shape or V shape down here above. Is because of the limitations of the land that it sits on. The back two thirds of that lot have active underground metra and Amtrak trains. And the front side is subject to a zoning law that requires a 30 foot setback for any building to build along the river. This is to ensure that the river front remains open and accessible to the public. As a quick little shout out, if you look out to our left, we can see. A uh, nice shot down the barrel of the main grants. If you're looking for photo opportunities, I don't want to like that with that as a surprise. So, between the, uh, the active train lines and the 30 foot setback, 
This building's designer, what they did was they worked with a structural engineer in Seattle, Washington, to design a building which reconnects the roof of both building A onto a strong central core. The result is this building's footprint is only 20% of the lot Now, whenever you're building tall buildings, one thing that needs to be accounted for is something called drift. This is the tendency for buildings to sway in high speed winds and elevation. Which, by the way, should be considered a feature rather than a bug, because things that do not bend tend to break. We don't want that happening with a high rise. It is, though, something that can be minimized or mitigated. The way that 150 North Riverside accomplishes this is with something called inertial slosh damper. Inertial slosh There are 12. When the wind pushes the building one way, the water sloshes back the other way, which helps to damage that kind of force. It keeps the building from moving as much as possible. We'll actually discuss a couple more methods of the course of the tour of how builders manage it. We look up ahead on the left side of the river. We've got this reflective building here with these metal tripod lakes out front. This is Bank of America Tower. And those metal tripod legs are this building's response to that 30 foot set. Bango, I'm going to go here. Yeah. They fall to the third floor into the air that needs to maintain public access to the river. Bango Mountain Tower costs $800 million to build. That's a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
also on the right. Completed in 1971, 80th century Greece designed in a style called international style, not a modern style of representation. So called because buildings like this could be and have been built in cities all over the world without looking out of place. By cladding the building in stone, it softens a little bit somewhat compared to the stark black box. And it also makes it more efficient to heat and cool, since it doesn't have to be exposed to the absorbing of the building. And as we approach the final take on the timeline portion of the tour, we leave behind the modern styles from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and we get an early example of contextualism in the recent decor of the current glass building of the head of the right. The curve and color of the English and the decor are fitted in 1983. Here is the curve and color of the Chicago building. In each pane of glass, they slight gold in the center to spread the overall effect of reflections on the rippled surface of water. All of these design elements put it in strong relationship with the Chicago River down below. Now, if you're curious about 